This time on Pedal Box, after a long break, waking up at the front of the car and on bodywork, we're finally back in the engine bay to work on some wiring. The biggest goal we've got for this episode is to get the engine and all of its electronics and wiring ready to install that new ECU that we've spent so long talking about. One of our big worries obviously for a long time has been that we've screwed some wiring up, that we've got short circuits in somewhere and that we might zap our second ECU, which is why we've been doing all of this testing that we have the last few episodes. But with all that stuff down at the fuse box and relay units at the front of the car done, we think we're about ready to start getting the engine working. And since we're back here for the first time in a long time, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've kind of been push putting off and neglecting for a while, which is plumbing around various like boost and uh, signal reference lines. We've got to power our intercooler fans on the back. And there's this great big bundle of wires here that we need to make sure we remember where all of it plugs into. So this stage was a bit of an adventure. We ended up digging a lot further into the engine loom than I really expected us to when we started out, but we've peeled a lot of it apart, branched it off new places, and rooted it in ways that make a lot more sense for us. Obviously, what v VW Audi did when they built this engine and this harness was probably quite sensible for them, for their requirements, but we need things in slightly different places, so we've sort of split things apart, peeled them apart, and, um, and changed things around quite a lot. And the result is all around me right here. Um, the result is also my knees are in a lot of pain, but that's my own problem. So we've got all of the wires that run around to the left-hand side of the engine, we've peeled off and run over that way. We've got our exhaust um, O2 sensor connectors, they're coming around this side, whereas previously they were on this big tail around that way as well. And we've just sort of generally tidied things up, re-taped uh, re a lot of the loom. This is all looking a lot better. We've also dug into some of these uh, coolant and boost lines and everything. So we've marked out a couple of holes on our boost pipe here where we need to drill a few holes and put some bosses on. Uh, here we have, I think this is uh, recirculation. So this is when we have like an overboost condition. So you know, the turbo spun up making boost, you close the throttle. This is just a little recirculation valve, I think that lets it back into the intake, or at least it's what it looks like. And I'm guessing this one here is boost reference because that goes into the bottom of the little uh, solenoid here that is on the other side, it's connected to the wastegate actuator. So my guess is we get pre uh, boost reference pressure in here for our, uh, sorry, in here, for our uh, wastegate control solenoid. We've got recirculation here. So we've just got to put a couple of barbs on here and here, and that will all be good. So those two bosses normally on the original car, they'd have been on the pipe that was plugged into here and ran across the top of the engine toward the intercooler that way. But obviously, because we've got rid of that pipe, we need to re-implement it all on here. Now the big win that we got out of this was relocating our ECU harness connectors. Now this isn't VW's fault, they didn't mean to put the ECU on the back of the radiator, their loom obviously went somewhere else, but the way it all came together for us was that the connectors ended up in front of the engine near the firewall here. And in fairness, that's not the end of the world. We could, ECU, we could mount the ECU on the back of the firewall here, but it would be quite tricky to get to. There'd be a lot of engine heat. There's not really a lot of air circulation down there, so it wouldn't have been great for access. So instead, in part of pulling them out, we've relocated these uh, connectors up into this top right corner. And that means we can use a mounting bracket that Aid made a while ago. So this fits on the ECU. The ECU kind of slot loads into it like that. Uh, back that way and then the screw on the top just sort of pinches it into place and then our connectors go on the bottom. We haven't worked out exactly where this is going to go to the millimeter yet but it's going to be up in this corner somewhere we're probably just going to weld it onto the body and we'll have a permanent fixture that we can install the ECU into but having it up in this corner gets it away from some of the engine bay heat gets it a lot easier access for us working on it in case we blow it up again which I'm hoping we don't but it's always possible and just generally makes life a lot better. Now another job we've been putting off for far too long is installing our diff blanking plate. This is a lovely billet piece of aluminium that I got off eBay and it has three little O-rings in. These two block off um, fluid pathways from the diff into the transfer box and this one just sits around the mating surface where it uh, basically blocks off where the original transfer case would have had an outlet going in, sorry, an, uh, 
inlet on the transfer case from the outlet on the diff, which would mate up between the two. So it just seals that off. And then our new um, output shaft drops straight through there and sits on the side of the diff. Now, the one that I originally bought quite a while ago, which is why this has taken so long, I bought a stubby one. These are unfortunately not the correct one that you need to make a four-wheel drive box into a two-wheel drive box. But now we've finally found this one, thanks to Matt. So we've got this all ready to go. We can bolt it on the side and finally get the diff set up so that we can start looking at our um, drive shafts as well, which is another thing we just haven't really looked at properly. You need that, Chris. Uh, you need one, two, three, four bolts. Yeah, no, it is actually too small. It's just wide enough to clear the top of it. Well. I guess maybe we're not gonna uh, install this now. Yeah. Well, that was very anticlimactic. Unfortunately, we are not gonna be able to put that plate in. There's nothing we can do to enlarge in that hole right now. So we're not gonna be able to put that on, which is really, really annoying because I genuinely thought we had a really nice win there getting that in place, but it's not to be. So we're gonna ignore it, move to the front of the car and with the last little bit of light we have left, try and take care of a problem with the bonnet. Now the problem we have is this cross piece that goes from one wing over to the other side. When we put this in, it was supporting a lot of the structure, but actually now we've got the stressed skin on, this top edge is probably redundant. And that's a good thing because when we put the bonnet down across the edges, it is sitting right on the skin. And when you push it down to latch it, you get a really nice positive latch underneath the airlocks, but unfortunately it flexes the bonnet down right across this point. So you have three points of connection, one at the front where the hinge is, one at the brace in the middle, and then one at the back. And basically it goes down and then has to try and bend like that. And it's only deflecting 10 or 12 mil at the back in order to engage. And that's after we've taken all of the adjustment out of the hinges at the front. They've got some nice big square holes in and we've got bolts going through and they just allow us to position it so we get it really nicely centered up and down in the body line. And even with that amount of adjustment completely used up with the front edge of the bonnet sitting probably 10 mil too high compared to where we designed it, it is still not enough to give a small enough amount of deflection that keeps the positive engagement on the latch and stop this from cracking, which is really, really frustrating. So we're going to have to look at removing this section of box that goes across the car edge to edge. If we really do need to put it, put something in again, we can go down lower. That won't be a problem, but we think it's completely redundant anyway. So remove that. And then we're going to put a brace across the side because we have this little notch here, which is what goes around this box section. We'll put a flat brace all the way along the edge, put some uh, holes in the side so that we can weld through um, and get some really nice uh, good engagement across there without having to weld a big long seam down the inside of the bonnet edge. And that will actually hold it at the right angle permanently with just the tiniest amount of flex left to give us some engagement on here. And if we do get it spot on, we can probably lower these hinges by maybe one turn uh, so that they're a little bit further down and it will still give us that engagement, but we'll actually be able to close the bonnet without cracking the paint. We did a lot of modification under the bonnet last night. We ended up chopping out both of these side spars. We didn't need them. They were absolutely fine to remove. There's no flex anywhere. So that's great. We definitely didn't need them. This spar, I think we were a little bit optimistic about how much space we still had above it. Considering this was put in expressly to support the underside of the bonnet, we ended up having to channel two little gaps out for these longitudinal spars on the bonnet to drop into to actually give us enough drop to make any noticeable difference. But when you close the bonnet now, it sits a lot lower down. You can actually see where the old top of that spar sat above the bonnet. So we've dropped it a good sort of four or five mil, at least maybe a little bit more, which is great news. The other problem we had, however, was the side of the bonnet, which we hadn't anticipated, was hitting these panels. So when we put these in, we exacerbated the problem we had with closing the bonnet and flexing it, and we didn't even realize. 
which is why it was quite so stiff and it had so much tension being put on these hooks that they weren't quite able to release and you really had to bounce on it to actually make it pop out. So to combat that we took off a small strip of each side just to try and relieve it so that it no longer touches on these panels. Both, both sides needed it to uh, varying degrees because of course they don't match side to side and we also raised the um, pin a full turn on this side which I think is about one and a half millimeters given the pitch of the thread and a half turn on that side and that has leveled it out really nicely across the car which is great we've been meaning to, uh, to fix that for a while and we can also hopefully dip the front of the hinges down in order to fix the gap that we have on the very front edge of the bonnet where that rubber lip is where where we've been trying to lift it up there's now a little bit too much of the front edge of the bonnet exposed so with a bit of luck this should solve a lot of our alignment problems and as you can see now when you release the bonnet it's a very marginal flex that you need to put on the corner rather than really having to lean into it to make it work. So in order to try and get that flex that we still need to put in coming across the entire bonnet, rather than being focused around this particularly weak spot here where we still need a gap to go around the lower spar that comes out to the wing from the inner structure, we're gonna put another piece of angle bracket in, just a very small one, but instead of having it coming down the side, as I say, we need this hole, so we'd have to take so much out, it would be pointless. We're gonna flip it around the other way because inboard, being a diagonal brace, we have a little bit more room in order for it to clear so we can put something in, join it onto this spar, weld it on the underside of the bonnet and uh, maybe then fix the paint after we've done all of this welding. Yeah, that's getting heavier. Well, there is a pretty good demonstration of why this car is taking quite so long. It is now raining. And although it is not the glorious summertime anymore, and we should expect it, this was not forecast for this weekend. We had a good day's work planned today, and we basically had to scrub it. So, uh, yeah, that's not ideal, particularly as Chris is only here for a limited amount of time. Yeah, and uh, I don't even have a microphone on, so I'm going to let Aid handle the whole <laughs> outro. And I'm going to go get a cup of tea. <laughs> Now on the upside, one thing we did do this week, before I threw it on the floor, was make up the IVA list. This is everything. I've gone through the IVA and checked off every section, things we need to make sure that we actually have checked, finished, to be able to put in for the IVA. So we're gonna be start working through that list very, very soon. And I'm also gonna try and do a series over the winter looking through the whole IVA bucket and what things mean what and what you have to do and why things are the way they are. So look out for that probably next year. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching. Do subscribe to us if you haven't already. Hit the like button, comment down below what you would do other than say build a garage across the top or put a cover up that's big enough to hold the whole car in. You can also support us at patreon.com forward slash pedalbox show. And if you are a patron member, you'll get discount at our shop, shop.pedalbox.show, where you can buy t-shirts like these and Mugs. Mugs, like this. That was very conveniently timed. So, thank you very much for watching. We will see you next time when, hopefully, the weather is a little bit better. Otherwise, we're going to have to tidy the garage and, like, do some work in there, but I'm not looking forward to that. No.